psychological protection from those things that you know you didn't yeah. want to see, yeah. right? Those those well, next pestilential time I'm down that way, vapors. I'm have to take a look for that. <laughs> right, and that's just it, right? You another thing that's popular too, and not so popular here, but in in Europe you'll find in uh, and obviously in the Catholics, right, with the holy water. Um, some some headstones have a little reservoir on them. It almost looks like a little, you know, like a, just a little, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, like a little, as my kids used to call them, bird baths. <laughs> mm-hmm. I know <laughs> what you mean, not. yeah. Yeah. And, yeah, and that was, to, you know, for holy water, right? And holy water water is another, um, you know, sort of com- cleansing and could be used, the blessed water could be used to keep away witches and vampires and, you know, all kinds of creatures that were supposedly, you know, violently allergic to holy water. And um, even in the, like during uh, medieval and and Renaissance, you would see that um, they would actually sprinkle holy water on homes, on people's front, um, you know, step over the area that they would uh, walk into the home in order to keep away pestilential vapors. Right. So just in case anybody was, you know, <laughs> so there's and, and iron again was used for that. Another thing that I'm, I've found and actually funny enough, my house in Hamilton, when we redid the porch, the front porch there, my brother um, came down and, and helped us uh, pull the whole porch apart. There was a massive piece of rose quartz under the porch oh. and it was obviously intentionally placed there it wasn't put there and oh, really? it had oh. to, yeah it, yeah it was just it was about oh, I don't know it, it it's big it's big, like bigger than my hand right a big piece of rose quartz and it was up at the very back of the porch against under the door so the 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 um, sill of the door and right up against the wall of the house under the porch, it had to have been put there, you know, at some point. And I mean, our house was built in 1895. So the original porch was there till we tore it apart. So it had to have been put in, you know, sometime within maybe the first four or five years of construction, perhaps, or somehow somebody got it in there, you know, after the fact, right? And I mean, it's entirely possible that, you know, somebody pulled some boards off of the side of the porch and and put it in there. But um, yeah, you know, so (laughs) that's another, you know, sort of another um, superstition or, you know, is that putting the rose quartz there um, to, you know, to keep the bad away and, and the good in. So you'll, you'll see some of these things um, throughout here in Ontario, but you'll see them mostly in the eastern, along the eastern seaboard of the United States. Right. Um, as, as people started to push west later into the 1800s, less and less of that superstition was carried with them as they went. But um, initially, you know, you'll see some of the very first sites like in, in Massachusetts or in Virginia um, places like that where they were first settled, you'll you'll find a lot of this wrought iron in the first half of um, right up to the first half of the Victorian era, and then it sort of changes, and then they start to, you know, opt for just other things, right? Stone, wood, whatever it might be, because I think some of those old beliefs started to die off, right? People people started to, um, you know, generations passed and, and some of those beliefs obviously weren't carried forward, right. With, with kids and grandkids sure, and sure. as they move forward. So they didn't, they didn't tend to have them as much. So, I mean, if you can find <clears throat> cemeteries with witches gates on them today, it's pretty spectacular because so many of them have undergone renovations and changes and you know some of those old gates may have rotted away and had been removed and you know now you see more of an aluminum gate or you know just no gate no gate at at all all. right Yeah, yeah no gate at all so for the most part there always would have been a fence or a wall around you know a graveyard 
a church's graveyard. Cemeteries, eh, they were they were a little bit different, um, depending again. But um, yeah, I mean, there's there's a number of cemeteries, old cemeteries that have nothing around them, and so you know that, and that's just because they're kind of a yeah. Mix. The old church graveyards, uh, they always had a wall. Yeah, right, a wall or a fence, right? And um, it, it makes me laugh too, right? Because uh, this, we as, uh, you know, the Halfpenny Dreadfuls, and we do a lot of the, um, we do caroling, Victorian care and that. But at Christmas time, we always do Victorian ghost stories because those carried, they, those carried through, right? That was something, ghost stories, because they didn't really celebrate Halloween like we celebrate Halloween, unless you were living maybe in Ireland or Scotland, um, and it was more, it was all Saints Night or, you know, your All Hallows Eve for your relatives, your, your ancestors. Um, but in the UK and London and that, they didn't really get into that too much. So their ghost stories always focused around, um, around Yule, like Christmas time. And mm-hmm. because there was no radios or television or, you know, so, and um, hence, you know, Dickens actually had an entire um, Petty Dreadful uh, yeah, well, publication. Well, of course, uh, Dickens. Yeah, when when I think of Dickens, I think of mm-hmm. um, Scrooge, a Christmas Carol, a Christmas Carol, uh, yeah. Scrooge. Yeah, yeah, and, what and, is the, that? and the stories, the ghost, of the story. ghost, uh, ghost stories. Yes, but there's also um, yeah. um, Joseph Lafanu, who was an Irish writer. He wrote some really great ghost stories too that often came out um, at that time as well. And he was writing, and there's one called the the uh, Ghost and the Bone Setter, which um, we put as a, a radio serial, so you can listen to it. But it's one that we often will do as a as a storytelling element for our um, our Christmas production stuff, and so we do it live, and and you know we we tell the story of the Ghost and the Bone Setter, but it's also a really neat story because it's based on a ghost and uh, an old priest an Irish Catholic priest who, um, you know, and the belief of if when someone dies, of course they have all of their, their Catholic churches are surrounded by walls and, you know, cemeteries like the walls and the, the iron gates and all of this. But the belief was that you didn't want to be the last one in the cemetery. So if your relative had died in some cases, especially during times like pandemics or, you know, things like that, Mm -hmm. a lot of people were dying People were literally throwing their loved ones over the wall of the <laughs> graveyards so that they weren't the last ones in because there was the belief that if you were the last one to be buried, that you were in purgatory and you had to bring water to every thirsty soul in purgatory. <laughs> oh. So it would be a never ending task. Right. Indeed. So, yep. yeah. So there's this whole idea of um, at some point they started to lower the church walls so that they could literally hoist the pine box over the wall, <laughs> even though they weren't buried in the ground yet. They, you know, they were they were there before, you know, before the next person because they didn't want their loved one to have to, you know, be stuck in purgatory to have to deliver water to all of these souls, right? That is so it's yeah. kind of a funny and it's a great story, but it it kind of harkens to this whole thing with, you know, the again, you know, keeping the bad things out of the cemetery, right? So these walls and these gates and, and all of these, you know, elements of iron and all of that stuff that, that are put on. And I mean that's why old coffins were were closed with iron nails. Mm-hmm. Right. Same. The same reasoning <clears throat> is that way. If you know something, if the person might have been, you know, who knows, questionable, um, they weren't able to escape their confines, or nothing bad could get in. Right. So, you know, if you were a vampire, <laughs> you were going to end up with, you know, rocks in your mouth and a stake through your heart and iron a nails through your heart and your. <laughs> Your head yeah. cut off and thrown into running water. That's it. And, you know, or you've got rocks shoved yep. into your mouth or you've got, you know, you're buried with piles of rocks on top of you, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all of these things were to keep those, you know, those spirits contained. And and that's pretty much what the witch's gate is all about. It's just keeping, but it's keeping things out 
and and you know it's because inside the cemetery inside the graveyard is a pleasant place to be apparently <laughs> well it, it right? is it, i you know talking about the very hollow um mm-hmm. i found it to be a very quiet peaceful place it is. It's actually really pretty in there. It's got beautiful big old trees that you know were planted when that cemetery had first been put there. Oh, yeah, and for sure. Absolutely. You can now see these, you know, 200-year-old trees towering over everything. And, and they're, it's quite, it is beautiful. I mean, it's small, but it's very pretty and very, it has a real feeling. And I know I asked you when you told me that you went, if you had been, um, visited by anyone because when I was there and I'd gone through the gate and I, I had the very first thing I did was I went to look at the obelisk that was standing still because it was like one of the only, (laughs) the only stone left standing there in, in its original place. Um, And you can still see, like I said, some of the, um, the little pedestals from the original stones are still, because some of the trees have actually kind of grown around them and that. So you know that those trees were planted sort of at that, you know, the head, the the grave was created and that tree was planted right there. And then it sort of grew up around. So, um, but that, as I had said, you know, I, I kind of walked over towards that and just at a certain spot and I wasn't quite there yet. And I heard this voice in my, in my head, and it said Elizabeth Blah, and that's all I heard. Elizabeth Blah, and I was like, mm-hmm. "Oh, Elizabeth Blah." And I said to Ed, "I go, um, okay, someone just talked to me, and they told me their name is Elizabeth Blah, 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 <clears throat> something." I couldn't hear the end of it, and uh, so then when I proceeded to go back, and in that first row of stones, there is a name, <laughs> Elizabeth. Yeah. Yeah, I don't remember well, what the last name on the there's, stone there's was. There's two but, Elizabeths uh, in there, which was funny because that's the very first thing I did was I went to the memorial stone and I looked, right? I'm like, okay, because this is going to be easier because all those names are listed on the memorial stone. And I saw Elizabeth and then I saw Elizabeth Blanchard. And I was like, mm, yep, because she said Elizabeth Blood, Blan, Blood. <laughs> And I didn't hear the end. Yep. It just trailed off. And sure enough, yep. there was an Elizabeth Blanchard. So I'm sure when I heard her, I was literally standing on her at the time. Yeah. <laughs> well, well, you can feel it. As, as we mentioned at the beginning of the show, when <clears throat> you're in there and the ground is uneven, and you can feel mm-hmm. when you're standing mm-hmm. on one of those unmarked graves now. But, right. Yeah, because there's divots the in the earth, right? So you 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 can feel yeah. like where they where they're sunk down. You know that that's where there's been settling. And yeah, and I, so. I was wandering around taking uh, photographs and um, filming what uh, Trudy was doing with our little uh, investigation we were doing there. Mm-hmm. And yeah, it's like suddenly, you know, I step down, and you know, it's like I don't want to break my ankle suddenly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh yeah, I'm I'm standing in this depression now in the ground, and I'm obviously, you know, unfortunately standing on somebody. But see, here's my thing with that too, and I don't know how you feel about it, but I mean, being that you know, I do archaeology and I do all these things, and I'm whatever you want to call it, you know, perceptive, psychic, medium, whatever it is. Um, and I hear these these people and these spirits and voices that talk to me. Um, I, I'm never worried about stepping on their grave, uh, mostly because it's not out of, you know, I'm not being disrespectful. So I'm not doing it out of disrespect. I'm not there to just trot all over their, you know, their last resting place, right? I'm there no, because I'm not. there doing something. So I think I think they I think they understand that. Right. I, I don't think that anybody, if anything, I think sometimes some of them are actually like oh, somebody I can communicate to. Right. Could be. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. You know, well, and, and I've often um, found. That's, oh, go that's ahead. why um, Trudy and I really got into the paranormal is because that's that's our philosophy mm-hmm. within our paranormal investigations is we want to communicate and we believe that some of those souls out there want to communicate as well, that maybe they still have stories they want to tell, they want information right. they want to get across. And that's why we do what we do. 